Good morning, everybody. We thank you all for tuning in. Uh, we're from uh, Grace Missionary Baptist Church at 1301 Beacon Street. We are back to uh, having uh, live services on Sunday morning. Uh, worship begins at 11 o'clock, and if you could come, uh, we'd sure like to, to see you here. So uh, before we begin this lesson this morning, uh, we'll go to the Lord in prayer. Our most kind and gracious Heavenly Father, our mouths are stopped this morning, Father, at your glory, at your majesty, at your goodness, your patience with us, Father. We are not worthy of it. But we are most grateful, Father, for the gift of salvation made available to us. Thank you, Lord, for the blessings of our home, our families, our health. Thank you for letting us live in this United States. Father, we're uh, starting a new session this morning in our Sunday school class talking about hope. And we do pray, Father, that you will help us to continue to have our living hope vested in you. We pray, Father, that you will forgive us of our sins and our wrongdoings against you, that you will continue to inspire us, Father, to be in the Word of God on a consistent basis and to cultivate an attitude of prayer. We praise you this morning, Father. We thank you for this privilege. And it is in Jesus' name that we pray. And amen. We're in a new book this morning. We're in uh, this first session is talking about hope. And we'll talk about today living with hope in a broken world. Hope comes in a lot of sizes and shapes. We all hope for our investments and financial planning uh, to pay off when it comes time to retire. We hope that that next diet that we try will be the one that will get us back on track. We hope that that candidate that we elect will make a positive difference. And we hope that the weather will be perfect uh, for perhaps a vacation that we have coming up. We might feel confident that our hope is well placed, but such hope is never certain. People disappoint. Circumstances change. Christ, however, is faithful and unchanging. When we place our trust in him, we gain a hope like no other. Because the believer's hope rests in Christ, we know our hope in him cannot be shaken. Therefore, we can approach the questions and challenges of life with confidence. Our hope in Christ gives us courage to stand strong in a broken world. Our hope in Christ sets us apart from the rest of the world in how we face suffering and how we respond to difficult circumstances. And it ultimately gives us a platform to share God's goodness and hope. When your hope wavers, or when you're tempted to place your confidence in earthly things that disappoint, how can you remain anchored to Christ as your hope? This study will examine the uniqueness and basis of biblical hope, whether in suffering, pain, prosperity, or contentment. Learn to place your hope in God alone and testify of his hope to the world around you. We have some verses we're going to read here. and Before we do, I want to share just a little story here at the beginning of your uh, personal study guide. A lady named Florence Chadwick she was a champion long distance swimmer. She had swam the English Channel 
and broken a world record in so doing. And her uh, next challenge that she aspired to was to swim from the mainland in California to Catalina Island. Well, she swam and uh, started out in that, and due to an oil leak probably on the boat that was following her, nausea, she got sick while she was in this second swim, and extreme fatigue. She swam for 15 hours. Fog set in. The temperature began to change, and her breathing became labored. She couldn't see the shore, and she felt like she was swimming in circles, and she lost hope. And she did something that she had never done before. She gave up and asked to be pulled from the water. And after being pulled into the boat and ministered to, she learned that she was only a half a mile from the shore. She had given up. The point of this story as I read this and what I got from this do you sometimes feel like you're swimming in circles? Are you tired? Are you nauseated this morning? Are the winds of adversity blowing against you? Are you fatigued this morning? Don't give up. We're closer now than we've ever been for our redemption draws nigh. Hold fast to your faith in Jesus Christ. Just a little longer. We know, Father, we know that this world is not our home, that we are strangers and sojourners here, that we live in this world, but our home is settled in heaven. And at some point in time, we will have the opportunity to go there. And I am really inspired by this uh, story of this lady. She did her best and tried her best, but just in a momentary time of weakness, perhaps, and being overwhelmed, she gave up. Brothers and sisters, don't give up this morning, but keep swimming, keep going. People place their hope this morning in a variety of things. Continued good health, a future spouse, family, better job, career advancement, and so forth. But all such hope are not guaranteed and often crumble in the face of circumstances and unplanned events. No one is exempt from life's difficulties and tragedies, but the Christian hope in Jesus Christ enables him or her to rise above all of life's circumstances. We are more in overcomers in Jesus Christ. Let's read some verses here. The Apostle Peter uh, in chapter 1, verses 1 through 9 this morning. Verse 1, Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to the strangers scattered throughout Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia, elect according to the foreknowledge of God the Father, through sanctification of the Spirit, unto obedience and sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ. Grace unto you and peace be multiplied. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to his abundant mercy hath begotten us again unto a lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ 
from the dead. We have a living hope in Jesus Christ. The same power that uh, rose Jesus from the dead will be the same power that will resurrect us also from the dead. Verses 4 and 5. To an inheritance. Now this is what the Christian has come to him. To an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled and that fadeth not away reserved in heaven for you who are kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. In verses 6 through 9 Wherein ye greatly rejoice, though now for a season, if need be, ye are in heaviness and through manifold temptations, that the trial of your faith, being much more precious than of gold that perisheth, though it be tried with fire, might be found unto praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ. Whom having not seen, ye love, in whom though now ye see him not, yet believing, ye rejoice with joy unspeakable and full of glory, receiving the end of your faith, even the salvation of your soul. Peter uh, had become one of the main leaders of the church after Jesus' death, resurrection, and ascension. His ministry was primarily to the Jews, and Jesus had charged him to tend the flock by feeding and nurturing them. That's in John chapter 21. Peter was one of Jesus' 12 apostles which meant he was sent with full authority to carry the gospel and spread the message of the kingdom of God. Peter's letter reflects his care for God's people. Peter loved these Christ followers and wrote to encourage them not to give up, lose hope, or grow weary. Don't give up this morning as we had uh, mentioned earlier we want to hang in there and uh, hold fast to our faith <clears throat> our hope is based this morning on the death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Peter calls the believers chosen to emphasize God's work in their lives. Our calling, identity, and the application of the gospel message are grounded in this summary statement of salvation. And that's in these first three verses that we just looked at. Peter points to the, uh, uses the term foreknowledge. And Peter wanted us to understand that God knew that we needed salvation. So he sent his son Jesus to redeem us from a life of sin. Also, Peter emphasized in his Pentecost sermon that God's plan was for Jesus Christ to die for our sin. It was God's plan. God knew exactly what was going to happen and what was to take place. And through the sanctifying work of the Holy Spirit refers to the work, the role of the Holy Spirit in our salvation. Just as the Holy Spirit was evident on the day of Pentecost, so the Holy Spirit is at work 
every time believers share the gospel with other people. We know right well that we can't save anyone. It is through the work of the Holy Spirit working on the other end through a person that we may be witnessing to. The Holy Spirit may be convicting this person long before we even speak to them. So it is a, a great work of the Holy Spirit that uh, in John 16 verse 8 that the Holy Spirit will convict the world about sin, righteousness, and judgment. And for that reason, we can share the gospel with others knowing the Holy Spirit will take that message and convict the hearts of people regarding its truth. Whether they receive or reject the message is not our responsibility because the Holy Spirit is the one who completes the work in their hearts. The Holy Spirit will sanctify anyone who is willing to believe the gospel and uh, be saved. And where it talks about here too, to be obedient and to be sprinkled with the blood of Jesus Christ, that Jesus Christ laid down his life and shed his blood in order to purchase our salvation. While he made the ultimate sacrifice on our behalf, we still must apply it to our own lives. And this, an example of this, that in Moses' time, the Israelites had to make a choice to apply the blood of the lamb to the doorpost of their home in order to avoid certain death. They had a choice whether to do that or not. And in the same way, we can choose to apply the blood of Jesus Christ to our lives to avoid future judgment. While the blood of Jesus must be applied to our lives in order to be recipients of salvation, what role does obedience have in the process. Obedience is the outcome of being united with Christ. It is the outcome of our decision to trust and follow Jesus Christ. If we trust him, then we will obey him because of what he has done on our behalf. Because Jesus rose from the dead, we have a living hope in a living Lord. And the new birth produces a change in us. Now we have a desire to follow the Lord Jesus Christ because he has given us new life. And some of the lasting truths in these first three verses that the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit are all involved in our salvation. You didn't initiate your salvation. God did through the drawing and the power of the Holy Spirit. Obedience is the outcome of our decision to trust and follow Jesus Christ. And we have a living hope in a living Lord. Now let's talk about our hope is secure for eternity. Our inheritance is kept in heaven for us. In Paul's letter to the church at Ephesus, he began his letter with a prayer. In Ephesians chapter 1, that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened so that you may know what is the hope of his call. What is the wealth of his glorious inheritance in the saints? And what is the immeasurable greatness of his power toward us who believe according to the mighty working of his strength? The hope, wealth, and power Paul mentions as our inheritance can be found in the indwelling presence of the Holy Spirit. That's why Paul told the Ephesian believers, 
believers that the Holy Spirit is the down payment of our inheritance. In other words, the presence of the Holy Spirit in our lives is a proof that we have an inheritance in heaven. I'm not the same guy that I was 20 years ago. Old things were passed away. Behold, all things have become new. And that is a work of God in my heart. I don't want to do the things that I used to do. I'm appalled by the things that I used to think were entertaining. This is all a work of God in the heart of believers. And with being indwelt with the Holy Spirit, you have the assurance that your inheritance is waiting for you in heaven. So we have the down payment through the Holy Spirit. What's the rest of the inheritance look like? It involves the fullness of our salvation, which includes not only being with God, but also the redemption of our bodies. And Paul wrote to the Roman believers in chapter 8, verse 23, we ourselves who have the Spirit as the first fruits, we also groan within ourselves, eagerly waiting for adoption, the redemption of our bodies. This part of our inheritance is a hope all believers look forward to experiencing someday. And Paul also wrote to the church at Philippi in chapter 3, our citizenship is in heaven, and we eagerly wait for a Savior from there, the Lord Jesus Christ. He will transform the body of our humble condition into the likeness of his glorious body by the power that enables him to subject everything to himself. What a wonderful day it will be when we experience the redemption of our body. No more aches and pains. They'll be a thing of the past. Now that we understand the contents of our inheritance, we need to know that our inheritance is safe and secure. Paul explains that, that our inheritance is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading. In other words, nothing can take our inheritance away from us. No thief can take it away from us. The passing of time cannot diminish it. This is an incredible reality we can trust because our hope is rooted in Christ. Christ is unchanging. He's the same today, yesterday, and forevermore. Christ is unchanging. Because Jesus rose from the dead, we also can be certain about our future resurrection. Paul in chapter 8 of uh, Romans, verse 31 and 32, tells us, what then are we to say about these things? If God is for us, who is against us? He did not even spare his own son, but offering him up for us all, how will he not also with him grant us all things? Hallelujah to the Lord this morning. Praise, honor, and glory is the Lord's. It's amazing to think about our future inheritance and you think about streets of gold and pearly gates and a crystal sea, but Christ is our treasure. The real treasure in heaven is going to be being with Jesus Christ, knowing Jesus and enjoying an eternity with him is going to be priceless. Even though our inheritance is secure in heaven, one may wonder about the challenges we face here on earth until the Lord returns. How does knowing my ultimate future help me get through the pain or problems of the present? How can I move forward in faith 
when all I see around me is discouragement and brokenness. Take a look around this morning on the news and what's going on in this country and in this world. You want to talk about brokenness? The circumstances of this life can overwhelm us so that our vision of the future becomes foggy and distant. In order to combat these questions, Paul encourages the believers here that we are being guarded by God's power. It was God's power who kept Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the fiery furnace. It was God's power who kept Daniel in the den of lions and not a lion touch him. It was God's power who kept the apostle Paul who was beaten, hungry, shipwrecked, in prison. It was God's power who kept him. Paul, uh, the apostle Peter tells us in his second letter by assuring believers in 2 Peter uh, chapter 1 his divine power has given us everything required for life and godliness through the knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and goodness when we walk with the Lord by faith we can trust him because he has given us everything we need to faithfully follow him. He is well aware of our struggles and our needs. Nothing surprises him. For this reason, we can depend on the promises of the scriptures and the presence of the Holy Spirit to overcome what problems we may face. Are you facing something this morning? I'm sure you are. I know that I am. And if it weren't for my faith in the Lord, I would probably have pulled the rest of my hair out. Because the Lord is with us, we can be assured that he will give us the power to faithfully follow him. And some facts about those verses here. As children of God, we have an inheritance through Jesus Christ. Nothing can take away our inheritance and God is protecting us until our inheritance is revealed at the proper time. There's nothing that can touch you unless God allows it. You are protected until he calls you home and he already knows the day and the time when he's going to call you out of here. Nothing can happen to you until God's appointed time. Our hope is displayed through genuine faith that we suffer grief in various trials, but for a short time. He wrote to, uh, the Apostle Paul wrote to the church at Corinth in 2 Corinthians chapter 4. Therefore we do not give up, even though our outer person is being destroyed, our inner person is being renewed day by day. For our momentary light affliction is producing for us an absolutely incomparable eternal weight of glory. So we do not focus on what is seen, but on what is unseen. For what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. When we focus on our future hope, it loosens the grip of discouragement that accompanies our present circumstances. While it's true that our time on earth is short compared to eternity, Rejoicing in our hope in Christ is vital for us to live out our faith in this world. When we choose to rejoice, our faith in Jesus begins 
to shape and develop in consistent Christian character. For this reason, our hope and our character are connected. The Apostle Paul writes in Romans chapter 5, We also rejoice in our afflictions because we know that affliction produces endurance, endurance produces proven character, and proven character produces hope. Because we have hope in Christ, our character begins to reflect that we know him. In the words of the Apostle John, in 1 John chapter 3, we know that when he appears, we will be like him because we will see him as he is. And everyone who has this hope in him purifies himself just as he is pure. Living with hope in Christ enables us to see by faith the day when Jesus will make everything right. Faith development is necessary for our spiritual growth as Christians. And the picture Peter used here to call the mind is gold being refined in a fire. In order for the gold to become pure, it must be uh, put in the furnace to get rid of the impurities. If you're in the furnace this morning, take comfort in knowing that God's hand is on the thermostat. These trials are temporary. We go through them to rid our lives of anything that is uh, contrary to uh, the Lord. And sometimes these things are very, very painful. I have something here else that I want to uh, share with you here concerning talking about hope and faith. John Piper, and this uh, a quotation from him, I would suggest, suggest that faith is the larger idea and hope is a necessary part of biblical faith. Hope is that part of faith that focuses on the future. In biblical terms, when faith is directed to the future, you can call it hope. But faith can focus on the past and the present too. So faith is the larger term. You might put it this way. Faith is our confidence in the word of God. And whenever that word has reference to the future, you can call our confidence in it hope. Hope is faith in the future tense. Our faith will become sight at the, at the end. That is going to result in praise, glory, and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. He alone is worthy of our praise despite the trials that we have to endure on earth. We will receive our reward in heaven. In James, in chapter 1, verse 12, Blessed is the one who endures trials, because when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life that God has promised to those who love him. However, our faithfulness to the Lord is simply a testimony to God, how God's power has worked in our lives. For this reason, he alone is worthy of all praise and glory. Though we have not seen him, not as the apostles had seen him, but that one day our faith will become sight, we will see him at his return, 
and we will rejoice with inexpressible glorious day uh, glorious joy our future hope enables us to rejoice in the present I'm so thankful this morning that this is not how this is all going to end that there's a better day coming for God's children that we will receive the goal of our faith the salvation of our souls the goal of our faith is salvation and through Jesus Christ our salvation includes three parts and I'll wrap it up with this that justification it becomes a reality in our lives when we repented of our sins and trusted Jesus Christ Peter's terminology of the new birth describes this experience for everyone who has been justified by faith in the sacrificial death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. The second part of our salvation is sanctification, which is our life of faith between receiving Christ and being with Him in glory. This is the time when we learn to obey and live a holy life. That's where we're at, where we're at right now, the believers. The third part is glorification. Now this is where our living hope uh, comes in, which is the moment when we see Jesus in glory. At that moment, we will be changed and enjoy his presence for all eternity. This is the story of our redemption, which gives us hope and joy as we contemplate its future fulfillment. Our minds can't comprehend what that day is going to be like, but we eagerly look forward to it. I thank you this morning. Pray for our country. Pray for our president. Pray for those that you uh, know that need the Lord this morning. And may the Lord make us useful vessels in his hand. Thank you so much and come Sunday morning.